Tiene. Good morning and welcome to Exile Kaplan Arctic Live. We are here at the UK Arctic Research Station in Nielsund on the island of Svalbard. Now that's about halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole. It's a beautiful morning here, um, bright sunshine, calm breeze and a great day for science. So the team are heading out on the fjord now, um, which is just behind me, running along sign the settlement here, the International Science Village of Nielsen. And they'll be trawling to find out if there are any microplastics, even here in the seemingly remote part of the world. Here in the Arctic Live studio at the UK Arctic Research Station, we'll also be looking at plastics, the microplastics day, here on Arctic Live. This morning we're doing a live investigation to look at sampling techniques. So how do you actually find out how many pieces of microplastic there are in the ocean without dragging a net through the whole thing? We'll be looking at uh, microplastics in the sea ice, so we'll be looking at a few techniques there. An hour after that ends, this session ends, we will be having an interview with Nick Scott, a master's student who's part of the University of Exeter science team up here. And we'll be talking about how he has been researching plastics uh, both here and in the UK, followed by an Ask Me Anything open Q&A at uh, two o'clock Arctic time, one o'clock uh, UK time, two o'clock European time. We're shifting over then to repeat those sessions um, for our North American audience, and it'll be great to have you join. Really excited uh, to have a number of schools um, joining today. Uh, we have over, hey, wow, 40 other schools joining from the UK, from Portugal, from China, Belgium, Nigeria, the Netherlands, India, Albania, and Russia. Welcome all. And we have two feature schools at the moment um, from Greece. Um, we have Mr. Bavaragos' class um, in Peristeri. And um, we have the fifth high school of Glyfada in Athens. Very big welcome uh, to both those classes joining us this morning. What we're going to do is we're going to split this um, live investigation session up into a few sections. We're going to start off by looking at sampling um, on the sea ice and do join in if you have prepared your sample trays using the instructions downloaded from the Digital Explorer website. We'll then be taking some of the pre-submitted questions but also wonderful. Please do join in and send your questions, comments and uh, other ideas over on the live chat on the Digital Explorer YouTube channel. Great to have GPS in India back again. Good morning, uh, Thurfield School. Big, big welcome to you. And uh, let's get started on our live investigation. For our microplastic sampling, we're looking at the sea ice. And when we're trying to find out how much plastic is in the Arctic, we're looking in a variety of different places. As I mentioned when I started, you can trawl through the water, so that's dragging a net, and you can see, is the plastic in the surface waters? Is it in the water column? You can also sample the sediment, the bottom of the ocean, to find out if the plastic's fallen down into the deeps. While we're up here, we're also trying to find out has a plastic got into animals? Is that where it is? Um, and so there is a variety of invertebrate species that were sampling as well. We were hoping to be able to sample some of the sea ice for plastics, but uh, when we got out onto the fjord, we found the sea ice was basically a bit mushy, um, very technical term there, and probably wasn't coming from the ocean, but was in fact frozen runoff from the glaciers that surround where we are. 
and we'll pop out for a bit just to see all those sites um, after the live investigation section. So I am going to look at sea ice and I have prepared my artificial Arctic Ocean. So here we are. Now, an amazing paper published just earlier this year um, showing that sea ice does contain um, a lot of plastics, um, much more than previously thought, uh, and scientists trying to work out whether that catches a sink, so is that where it all collects and, and comes out of the ocean. So how do you actually sample for it? So what we're not doing and what the scientists didn't do is take the entirety of the Arctic sea ice, melt it down and filter that through uh, for plastics. Um, instead, they uh, sampled. And so what I've got is a tray. We've got some frozen Arctic Ocean water in here just for added realism, and it's much easier to call through. Uh, I'm not sure if you have access to frozen Arctic seawater where you are, but if you want to make up a sort of representative um, idea of, of what that's like, it's about 35 grams of uh, salt um, per litre of tap water. Uh, then very luckily up here we have um, access to a bit of snow, which we put on top here. Um, I don't know whether you have snow at the moment um, in India or the UK or Portugal, probably not. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to put this on top here. What we did, ooh, very uneven snow surface, we can talk about that in a bit, but we've put some pink peppercorns. And it's great if you're doing this in, at school, is to try and use some organic um, items such as lentils to, to act as your proxy plastic. Um, we don't want you to be using bits of plastic and then putting that down the drain. So what we've done, we've scattered um, plastics throughout our ocean, throughout our sea ice. And what we're going to try and do is find out how many plastic particles are in this section of sea ice. Now what I want to think about is, do I just take this and search through the whole thing? If this was the entirety of the Arctic Ocean, would that even be feasible? What are your ideas um, about how you sample? And how might I use my ice corer, this the ordinary kitchen apple corer, to find out what's going on here? Let's see if we've got any ideas. No snow in Cambridge, it's 20 degrees. And can Charlie Myers from Fairfield get a shout out? Of course you can. A very good morning to you, Charlie. Um, we have no, no snow in Leatherhead either. A little bit chillier there at 13 degrees. Um, a big welcome to Mr. Vernier's class in Belgium, Miss Gibbs' class from Terra Nova. Um, uh, Miss Gibbs' Terra Nova class at the Landmark International School. Wonderful to have you all, all online. So what I'm going to do is think that one of these represents an entire expedition. It's very, very tricky to get up here. Um, it takes uh, many resources to get us up to the UK Arctic Research Station. And we found that even though we've been here for two weeks, we've only had four days of sampling. So maybe I'm gonna give you four apple cores to try and find out how much plastics um, is in our Arctic Ocean. Can I get an idea about um, where we should where we should sample first? Hmm. I am going to go for a good old sample in the middle here. I want to see. Oh, come up blank. Um, so we can't find any plastics in that central core. Does that mean that there is no plastic in the Arctic Ocean? We took one core and it came up blank. 
So what we're trying to find out is that balance between expending a lot of effort, a lot of work, and also making sure that our sampling method is representative. Wow, oh great, sorry, we're just checking out the live feed and we have Ben, uh, Will and Charlie from Thurfield, um, well winners of a set two science competition. Congratulations, perhaps you can be thinking about how we can get a representative amount. I'm just going to like stand up. Ellie, who's behind the camera, will probably shout at me for, for, for coming the wrong way, but I'll put a bit of a shade on this as well. And we're going to try pouring into this side area, maybe on the side of the ice. Then some plastic particles. So I'm just going to go in here. And I've got back to my ship. Is that okay, Ellie? Yep. I'm just going to melt down. Of course, you'd use a far more scientific method than squidging bits of ice, sea ice, um, with your hand. But there we go. We have five plastic particles in here. And you can see them on that. Oh. And there we go. So the difference there being on one plastic, on one ice core, I found nothing. And on the second ice core, I have been finding, I found five plastic particles. Now, how many more should I be doing? Students are suggesting we take multiple samples. How many is multiple? And what we find in the Arctic is we just have to be slightly realistic. And I have Nick, who's actually watching us here, going, Jamie, your sampling technique is just a bit pants. Uh, <laughs> Nick, if you can shout out from behind the camera, how many, how many ice core samples should we be taking here? What would be a representative amount? I think at least three. At least three, yeah. at least three. And, and how come you've come up with that number three? Three, well, it's a good balance between how much effort you can expend in one location and how many locations you want to see. So Nick, they're saying that three is a good balance between the amount of information I'm getting and the amount of energy or effort I'm expending. All of you who have happily caught ice out on the Arctic sea ice, um, you'll know that it does take a lot of effort. And I'm just going to pick my final one. Why am I going to put my final one at three? Good twisting the time spent on a glacier pouring. All this seems to have gone down there underneath. Um, to the sea ice underneath, and I've pushed my core back through, and we've got some very tiny um, particles. If I just hold that, I can actually look down my ice hole and see what else I can find in there. Right. In fact, there was one tiny particle in my ice core um, that seems to have disappeared in my really robust sampling techniques. Put that to one side. Am I allowed to take just one more? I think so. Allowed to take just one more. Just see if we can go back. last my well, four days of sampling of the four days that we've had up here in the Arctic because of weather and there again finding this sample containing four pieces of microplastic and so on average then I'm saying I've got two cores which had nothing um, in it and two cores that had five or well, this one is yes five I've got to see a tiny bit um there in my palm five pieces of microplastic 
And through that, um, Nick, well, I would then just add all those together and find an average, wouldn't I? Yes. Yeah. So um, your amazing maths um, there. So five plus five plus zero plus zero is ten, and that's divided by four. I think if I'm right in saying, then that gives you. I'm just going to take this. I'm going to walk my hand because it's quite cold. Um, that would give you an average of two and a half. So if you multiplied the size of that ice core and find out how many ice cores represent the whole of the Arctic Ocean, I would say on average we find two and a half pieces of plastic per core, we can then begin to say, well, we estimate that there are, for instance, 250 um, pieces of plastic um, in the Arctic Ocean, for instance. The, the actual numbers are, are frighteningly much, much more. Um, but we are estimating here, because we've only got time for one core per day, taking one core here, out, one core in the centre, one core over here, and one core at the other end. Now, Nick, I've spread my cores out. Is that good science? I think so. If you want to check a whole region, but then if you wanted, to, if you had a, a better inclination of where they might be forming, then you might target your sampling to a specific region. Fantastic. So thumbs up there from Nick. If I want to get a representative uh, idea of a whole region and spread them the maps, um, a good idea. If I have an idea that in fact I might get more microplastics around the edge. I might test quite a few around the edge and then compare that to what's happening in the, in the centre just to get, get that comparison. So some of the difficulty, and I'm just going to kind of sit down again. Some of the difficulty of sampling in the Arctic, and we found this on this trip, is that the weather isn't the kindest up here. And so you can come up with an idea, you can get loads and loads and loads of work done. But real science happening um, with a coring tool being out on the wild expanse of the Arctic Ocean, a very difficult place to get to, let alone to work in. That we're not gonna be able to take huge amounts of samples. Um, and as scientists, part of the job is working out from those samples that we do take, these four samples we took, what conclusions can we draw about how the Arctic Ocean uh, might be affected by plastic in general, in this case, the Arctic sea ice. So I wonder how you got on um, back um, in your classrooms with taking your own ice cores and seeing how much you can estimate, or how well you can estimate, um, how many pieces of plastic are in your ocean. I'm rather lucky insofar as I counted out my peppercorns um, last night, making our artificial Arctic sea ice. And maybe I cheated slightly in estimating there were 100 um, possible samples to take, because there were in fact 250 peppercorns in here. And I found uh, two and a half on average in my course. Um, so that is uh, science in the Arctic. It is also what we're doing when we're towing for plastic, um, up here trawling for plastic, towing that net behind the boat. We have um, different sample sites, standard sample sites. Some might be back here, we'll go outside and just a tick um, at the head of the fjord. Some might be um, in the middle of the fjord and some further out towards the open ocean. Lots of great um, questions coming through. I'm just going to go through a few shout outs. We're then going to go outside and then we'll get to the pre submitted questions. Great idea of taking multiple samples there. Um, We've got Manlo who's enjoying the science in Ambrose High School, Coatbridge. 
Um, that's fantastic to have you on board. Um, Sophie's finally found her inner scientist. That's great to hear. Um, and we are not in Antarctica. We are on the opposite end of the planet. Um, we are in the Arctic. Um, and so we'll have some more um, questions coming through. And a great comment there just from the um, office in London. If we can keep the live chat for questions, um, that will be absolutely perfect. Lots of questions coming through and hopefully we'll be able to answer those soon. But having done our pretend science, or pretend science, our modeling of, of, of how science works in the Arctic, we're now going to head outside and give you a show of where we've been doing the science for real. this section I also referred to being at the UK Arctic Research Station and a research station is a building like this one which is built for scientists to come up and research in the Arctic so Nick who's very kindly been giving us some sampling tips we've got Katie and Clara who are at on the boat there from the University of Exeter uh, in the UK and they are coming out here they need someone to stay the base of research from the bedroom, we've got the schoolroom, we've got our studio, we've got offices and lab space. We're now then to have the support they need to operate in this hard environment. They may not feel that harsh today, uh, but with three days of high winds. Um, it certainly felt hard to bend. Further behind, you might be able to see some of the um, operating the building, the workshops, uh, some the containers there. And that's because we're in an incredibly remote and isolated environment. And here in the Arsene, we need all the backup that's possible. So we need to be able to fix anything, whether that be a car, a power station, um, a boat when we're here uh, because certainly in the winter months when it's 24 hour darkness it's very very tricky to get any spares into your completely sensitive lines. Well let's head back inside and get some of your questions, get those questions coming through on the live chat as well. Closer to where I keep the, the Arctic draft out there. And we're going to go to some great questions sent in um, from Greece. And we're going to start with um, Mr. Vivaragos, his class in Peristeri. And the first question there is from Spiropolu and Macrelli, and it is when, sorry, that's going to be Constantina and probably Maria Lenny. Sorry, I got that slightly the wrong way around. How are we looking down here? Um, when did the scientists start monitoring, monitoring the microplastics in the Arctic, and what changes were observed in the following years? That's a great question. So we've had the research paper 
which I've referred to earlier about finding microplastics um, in the sea ice. And I think that's been an ongoing study for about eight years, eight, nine years. Um, and that hasn't been so much looking at the change over time because they haven't been going back to the same place. That's gathering as many samples as they could to be able to publish uh, a scientific paper um, that um, gives an idea of the, you know, that number of samples, giving you an idea of how many microplastics are in the entire Arctic sea ice. For us here in the Olesund, looking at microplastics in the fuel that I just showed you, this is the first of three years, so very much hope to be able to share with you how that might be changing over time in the future. Great question there. Um, how do microplastics affect the health of the organisms in the Arctic? Are there any studies comparing these health effects with data from the rest of the planet and humans? Um, that's from Jasonas and Synovia. Um, microplastics um, are very, very interesting insofar as we, we, we've seen on, on television and on, on programs um, sort of maybe bigger animals having sort of larger plastic particles in their stomachs or becoming entangled in nets and being harmed in that way. Now the problem with microplastic particles, and we're not talking about something the size of a peppercorn here, we are talking about things that are often down to about a fifth of a millimeter in, in, in size. And they can be confused for food by the animals at the bottom of the food chain. And here in the Arctic Ocean, those are animals such as copepods and amphipods. Now, what impact does eating plastic have instead of eating algae? Well, if there are too much plastics and there's too much confusion, then they are going to get less energy. And if you get less energy as a copepod, that means you might not grow as fast. We really actually don't know enough about the long-term impacts of microplastics on Arctic zooplankton, um, but it's a very, very important area of study. In fact, there are laboratory studies happening um, across the world looking at how microplastic particles may harm and may affect these animals. Um, and we're looking at, for instance, there's everything, there's human studies on whether the plastics we breathe can cause inflammation in the lungs, um, to whether they are in fact um, responsible for carrying other chemicals um, that may be um, in the water. So very much an emerging um, part of science. But certainly, eating and confusing plastic particles um, instead of your food stuff, everything from the largest animals um, in the marine environment, whales, all the way down to some of the smallest plankton, it is not good for animals to be eating plastic instead of their natural food. So, um, Ilias, is it true that washing polyester clothes in the laundry might be a source of microplastic pollution. Great question. It is true um, that it may be a source of the fibers um, that get into our oceans. And I think, and I don't know what the name is, do shout out um, here in the studio or back at home if you know the little widget that you can get for your um, washing machine um, to help out. Ellie, you look you're like poised to say something. There's one called an eco egg. Eco egg. Yeah. And you put that in your washing machine and it helps. Traps all the fibers. And it traps all the fibers and stops that getting into the water system, which can then end up in the ocean. So an eco egg, I'm not sure. <laughs> do, do look online to find out if there are any eco eggs. What I think should be standard is that we have proper filters on our washing machines to stop um, those microfibers getting into the water system and perhaps ending up even here um, where we are in the Arctic Ocean. So just think it's something to, to try and act upon because microplastics from your polyester clothes could end up here in the Arctic, could end up in the belly of a polar bear. Okay. 
go. Okay, here we go. Since the 1st of January 2018 in Greece, um, um, Greece joined uh, the group of countries that charged for the use of plastic bags, single-use plastic bags. We are afraid that even if we minimise the use of plastic bags and straws, we cannot avoid using some other plastic objects like examination gloves. Um, do you believe that biodegradable plastics might solve the problem? It's a really, really great question. And I think when we have an attitude um, or we think about plastics, probably our attitude isn't that, you know, plastics are necessarily bad. They've done a lot of great things. And, and you, you point out to um, medical equipment there, examination gloves, and a whole other hosts of, of medical um, uses for plastics that keep things very sterile and have been responsible um, for probably saving many, many lives over the years. What we do need to think about and what you point out there, are there other alternatives available um, that um, are um, less um, intensive on the environment? For instance, a biodegradable alternative. One of the problems um, with biodegradable um, substances used in, in, in medicine is that they do biodegrade. Um, so that's not always what you want. Sometimes you want something that won't degrade. But when we do have something that won't degrade, is there a way that we can recycle or reuse that um, item more effectively? Um, so you're very right um, that there are things that we should be phasing out. There are alternatives that we should be using and developing in the future. And there are those some of those uses for plastics um, that are incredibly beneficial, especially in a medical arena, um, where we might find other methods of reusing those plastics or recycling them more effectively. And um, from all of you um, in Paris area, we have, can you share um, with us one of the most dangerous and one of the most wonderful moments of your life in the Arctic. Wow, uh, one of the most dangerous. I think the most dangerous thing about being in the Arctic is sometimes relaxing um, when you are out in the field. The weather can change so, so quickly. So we might have gone out in the boat or we might have gone off on a snowmobile and it's a beautiful, calm, sunny day like this morning we head out and we think, oh, you know, we can just go off in, you know, light clothes and, and you know, just sort of have a couple of peanuts in our pocket just as a snack. The weather can turn really, really quickly. Uh, and so some of the most dangerous um, times, I think, in the Arctic have been where we've been up on a glacier uh, and the weather's turned really, really quickly. It's become a complete whiteout. Um, and that means there's no contrast between the sky, the clouds, the snow, the snow and the the snow in the air, the snow on the ground, and you can become very disoriented very quickly, slightly panicky. You need that extra energy from the spare food you're, you're, you're taking with you. You need the communications equipment working properly, and you need those extra clothes to keep you warm as well. So dangerous is relaxing and not respecting the Arctic environment. In terms of wonderful, I had two things I really like about the Arctic. Um, I love the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, simply spectacular um, here. In fact, it's well by the, the Southern Lights, because they actually happen a bit further south, um, down that way, we're above the main Aurora band. Uh, the other thing I really like, I get teased about this by the rest of the team, I love squeaky snow. Um, when it gets cold enough for the snow to squeak, so you walk and I go, and so um, that's something I really, really like. It hasn't been cold enough this year for that. Um, I think that's down to minus 15, minus 20 Celsius. Um, but I really like squeaky snow and northern lights, or southern lights, as they are here. Great, we're going to go over to uh, Athens now in fifth high school. Um, they have recently heard about the discovery of a bacteria that can eat certain types of plastic. Um, could this help drastically reduce plastic accumulated in the oceans? That's a really, really good point. 
and it's um, the, the current discovery um, that you're talking about is actually a bacteria that's found in, on a recycling dump, I think, in Japan, and then further researched by um, a team at Plymouth University. And so it's not a terrestrial um, a bacteria, it's a, they call it petase, the enzyme that's produced, and it is going to help probably in the recycling process. Um, what it does is it breaks down um, plastics into smaller pieces. And so that's maybe not great for the marine environment because it's those smaller pieces that we're finding are getting into the plankton. But certainly that doesn't mean that there can't be more research both into ways and natural ways in which we can recycle more effectively and also into new uh, materials and new substances which we can use instead of plastic. I think in, if you're wanting to reduce um, the impact of plastics on the ocean, I think that's very much an upstream problem. And that means reducing the amount of plastic that gets into the ocean in the first place. Is it possible? Here we go, is another question. That due to global warming and the melting of ice, huge amounts of microplastic become released into the environment. What would be the consequences? It's a, it's a really interesting um, question and we're talking about earlier, we're talking about the sea ice up here in the Arctic and as the microplastics in the water have sort of washed against the sort of sea ice front that's accumulated and, and, and taken them out of the ocean. So what we're saying here is the Arctic sea ice is forming a sink, it's collecting them. So they were in the ocean beforehand, if the Arctic sea ice were to melt they would be released um, back into the ocean. So it's very difficult to say on balance whether, you know, what are the consequences for um, melting sea ice on the amount of microplastics in the environment. Um, overall, the sea ice has, has taken them out of the ocean and then um, released them back into it. I think it's fair to say that if the ocean currents are bringing microplastics into the Arctic environment, concentrating them here, is certainly going to have a negative impact on the plankton because they'll be finding there's greater concentrations of microplastics compared to their food. Um, here we go. European countries have uh, started taking measures against plastic accumulation. Are there any organis organisms that could serve as bioindicators of microplastic pollution? Is the Arctic the best um, environment for rapidly monitoring change. I see Nick, who's, who's got a comment here. Do you want to dive in on this, Nick? Yeah, sure. Well, that's actually my research. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> come, come on round and, 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 and ha ha have a seat. So, we've got Nick, who's at the forefront um, of that research. And we come, come and grab that onto oh, your lapel to see you're there. Um, Great, if we just yeah. put it maybe so it's on the outside so we don't yeah, get too much, or not on the inside so we don't get too much rustle there, we can hear you clearly. Okay. Go for it. Tell us hey about, um, where were we? Um, so the question was bioindicators. Bioindicators, oh, yes. microplastic pollution. Well, that's actually my research. So at the moment I'm researching uh, whether mussels and shellfish that filter feed in the waters on the coastline can be used as a bioindicator for microplastic pollution. Um, and what we're finding is that in the areas where they live, they can actually be used as a bioindicator for the fraction of plastics that are available to them. So there is some size selection uh, going on in mussels, but um, each different organism will have a different range of plastics that they are capable of eating. Fantastic. And um what I'm, I'm interested, I mean, this is a wonderful um, class here in, in Greece, obviously um, a quite sophisticated question. Mm -hmm. What is a bioindicator? A bioindicator. So a bioindicator is an organism that you might potentially use to look at, to uh, take a representation of how many microplastics are entering a food chain or a certain, uh, certain species. Wow. So it's a bit easier to, is it a bit easier to, because one of the problems we've got is something, mm -hmm. so do, do muscles make, make, make our life easier? 
Um, for some, some cases they do, and for some cases they don't. So if you want to see what microplastics in the water, are in the water, you might be better off looking at the water. So for us, we find that there's a big difference between what the microplastics that you find in the surface water and what you find in the benthos, in these, uh, near the sediment where the mussels are actually living. So you could say that they're a good bioindicator of the sediment and the benthos, but they might not be such a good bioindicator of the surface water. Amazing. Well, stay with us, Nick, um, mm -hmm. because we've got some questions um, coming in from India um, and also a couple of, um, here we go, um, it's a bit about life up here. Are there any negatives of being in the <laughs> Arctic? Not really. It's, uh, it's so beautiful here. Um, I think sometimes when you're sampling uh, and it's very cold, um, that can be quite challenging. Um, we had a day uh, two days ago where we were out far out on the outer, on the mouth of the fjord and trying to sample while the boat is rocking from side to side and uh, trying to fight seasickness. It's, um, that's challenging. That's okay. a few a few challenges, but overall, but overall, pretty awesome, beautiful, fantastic. <laughs> um, and a question coming in here from the students of DPS in India, um, and it's about minimizing the research team's carbon footprint in the mm -hmm. Arctic. And I think one of the ironic things that we've mentioned in, in previous calls is that um, we have diesel power mm -hmm. um, here, and it, it's really tricky. Um, the recycling is, is, is pretty good though. I mean, how many categories of, of rubbish do we have up here? Oh, so many. It's like 20, <laughs> yeah. 20, 25, something like that. Um, so, I mean, the difficult thing is that for doing science, you've got some samples here in a freezer. Mm -hmm. You have to have reliable source of energy. 24 hour sunlight now, but in the winter, 24 hour darkness. So it's, it's tricky reducing your carbon footprint um, coming, coming to the Arctic. Um, it's one of the ironies of science sometimes, isn't it, that you're coming to research these things um, and it's, it's um, tricky to, you know, you've got to get out of the boat um, if there's no wind, do you use a motor, that, that, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, but here we are, another, um, well, this is great from the students um, in India, while on research study in the Arctic, what is your typical day like, what is your typical routine? Typical routine. Um... Lots of preparation the night before, I think, uh, so that you can make sure that once you're up in the day and you're ready to go, that you can go straight out because you can encounter problems with your, with your sampling technique. Um, yesterday we prepared everything and then the winch on the boat broke, so that completely changed our sampling day. Um, so it can be highly changeable depending on the weather, but um, we try to get out on the water as much as possible um, for as long as possible. Fantastic. And, and you're starting what, sort of six in the morning, eight in the morning, something um, like that? We're normally up at around eight o'clock, don't we? Um, yeah. And then getting to bed after a long sampling day? Past midnight. Past midnight. <laughs> wow, so long days here. But I suppose um, we're only here for a couple of weeks, mm. so we have to make the most, the most of, of our short time here. Um, a couple of questions um, from some other schools. We don't have the names of the schools up here. I uh, we do have a Thurfield school. Um, you would like to know your favourite thing about the Arctic, and Nick, I think this is your is this your first trip. This is my first trip yeah. in the Arctic. Yeah, I think my favourite thing about the Arctic. There are two things. I think um, one is that there are glaciers and mountains in every direction you look from. Uh, especially when you're eating dinner, we found a, a really good view from the canteen, which the is canteen a, in the Arctic. Yeah, canteen in the Arctic. Wow. It's uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> It's a, um, yeah, it's, we have good resources here. Um, my second favorite thing was I think we had a really long sampling day, an eight hour sampling day. Uh, we were very tired on the way back. And then just as we were pulling into the harbor, we turned around and we saw a, a walrus. So oh, a full grown, yeah, huge walrus. And that was my favorite thing about the Arctic so far. Walruses, <laughs> uh, beautiful views and glasses. Yes. That's fantastic, and, and a nice canteen. And a nice canteen. Great stuff. Um, a question coming in here, um, and, and it's asking about some of the sort of litter that you might typically find in the UK. Mm. Do you see the sort of the supermarket carrier bags, some of those items that we see in the UK? Do, mm. we, do, we, do we find that kind of plastic pollution 
um, in the Arctic? In the Arctic. Uh, not so much. It's quite different, actually, because so in the plastic pollution that you've seen probably on the beaches uh, in the UK, you can see that it's mostly uh, packaging and consumer products. But in the Arctic, the kinds of plastics that we're finding are much, much smaller, the, um, the smaller fragments. So we're thinking that the plastic that is making it to the Arctic has been in the sea for a long time. So it's breaking down over time before it gets here to a point where we can't really recognize what it originally came from. And, and might it be, I mean, I, I know that it's, we're talking about where does the plastic in the Arctic, mm -hmm. Arctic originate. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way of saying this might have been a, a, a plastic bottle, mm -hmm. um, drinks bottle from, from Europe? Or, um, or, 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 or can we just go? Well, you know, it, it's here, and and it's it might have an impact on the on the life up here. Can we only make quite limited claims? Well, we can we can look at the types of plastic that are here. We can figure out the types, and we can look at the types of the sources of plastic. So we know that, say, a plastic bottle is mostly polyethylene terephthalate. Yeah. And if we're finding fragments here that are similar, then we might suggest that it's coming from a similar source, but we can't be entirely sure. So, but we can suggest mm -hmm. that, I mean, if there are similarities, then if there are similarities, yeah. yeah. Um, we can also look for uh, localized sources too. So we know that uh, boat paint might possibly be a local, local uh, okay. source of microplastics here as well, um, from shipping and from so we know where certain fragments may be originating, but we can't be 100% sure on suggesting that the ones in the Arctic are from the same location. Brilliant. And we talked um, before about how um, microplastics are being eaten by plankton. Mm -hmm. A question here from the students of DPS in India. Um, and um, we're talking about talking about really bioaccumulation so mm -hmm. that if you're a, a, an Arctic cod eating the coca pods mm -hmm. and all those plastics end up in you and that carries on through, does it? Yeah, it does. So, um, so we know that it can be passed from organism to organism. What we're not entirely sure of is whether as how much it stays within those organisms or how much it's retained within those organisms or whether it just passes through. But this is something that we're looking at. This is something that scientists are, are really trying to understand. So lots of great questions. Um, and I think that was from um, DPS in India. There is an Indian research station just a couple of buildings down, so maybe come up here and, and help to answer some of those great questions coming through. Um, the students at um, Thurfield are thinking about what is, it, we're talking about the plastics problem. Mm -hmm. What is the best way of helping? The best way of helping? Um, well, I think it's really about uh, looking at your choices of how you, uh, your, your plastic impact as well. I think that as an individual, you can definitely have an impact on, on how you choose uh, to purchase certain items, certain packaging. Um, but also there is that fact that sometimes you don't have a choice, so you can't feel too guilty about not being able to live a plastic-free life because plastic is so useful, as you've already said. So I think the best way of helping is, yeah, is to is almost to maintain that kind of pressure of we want to reduce our plastic and uh, trying to reduce the plastic in your own life. I mean, could you do a, a plastic audit, for instance, and to try and for a week look at all the plastic you use? Don't worry too much mm -hmm. about whether you, you know about reducing it at that point. Carry on as you are, and then look at all the different plastic hues and then say, well, actually, I can do without that one. I can do without that one. So it's so a working down your list. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. So maybe some plastic. one week. Yes, <laughs> and at school, so school um, as well. Think about doing a plastic audit um, and, and see how you get on and where are those areas um, that are easier to find an alternative or, or simply not to use plastic at all. Um, we've got a, a number of other questions coming through. And I just want to ask our um, schools taking part. Um, we've got a couple of the Greek schools um, we have um, students in India um, because we're getting to the cracky. We've got a question from Eden in Belgium. How many of you are able um, to join us for the interview with Nick, which is in just over an hour's time? Um, because we are we are over time at the moment here in the Arctic. So many great questions, and thank you. Um, Nick for, for jumping in on, on, on the um, bioindicator piece and un answering some of those other questions. Um, I think what we might have to do is we've got that s section up 
we're going to take um, those questions, we're going to save them for um, the interview with mm -hmm. you in just over an hour's time and get to all, because they're great questions, um, so thank you for those. Um, but until then, um, we've been overwhelmed by the interest in plastics. Um, thank you very much um, to the team here at the XL Catlin Arctic Live Arctic Studio, the northernmost studio in the world. Uh, and we very much look forward to seeing you back here in an hour, interview with Nick Scott. Until then, goodbye from the Arctic. Goodbye.